All right, a few people have asked me how do I do some of these pens and make the multiple designs and turn them out. So, uh, box holder, I'm sorry, yeah, it's a uh, dyed brown, um, box holder, or buckeye elder, I can't remember, I'd have to look at the tag. Here's blue, dyed blue, same material, and what I've done, is I've cut, you can see the two different uh, colors there, and the shiny stuff's glue. There's the blue one, it's nothing but a perfect geometric square. And then I've taken the lighter color wood, brown box elder, and I've 45'd it, two 45 pieces, and then I've glued them together. What I'm going to do is, uh, I've got a truing block, um, for machi machinist truing block, it's a big piece of granite. Uh, it's a grade B, if anybody really cares. And I just lay a piece of sandpaper on it. What I'm going to do is take this, make sure this edge is perfectly flat before I laminate it with another piece of wood this direction. I'm going to take it to a truing block and sand it a little bit. And basically the pen is, barrel is going to run this way. Okay, next up, I've taken this to a Turing block, just showed it to you. And then, um, once again, a Turing block's nothing more than a big piece of granite. Machinists use it for metal work a lot of times. Uh, you can buy it in grades, but it is a surface that is perfectly flat. And uh, they're quite large, they're extremely heavy. And all I've done is ensured that this is perfectly flat. Technically, I should take wet dry sandpaper, let it soak so it sticks to the block flat so I don't end up with round edges. You machinists know what I'm probably talking about, but um, I'm going to go with Afzilla and I'm going to stick it right here. I need to true this piece of wood, although I cut it, um, I need to make sure it's perfectly true. What you're going to end up with, remember, or it's going to look like this, it's going to sit the barrel of the pen is going to sit like that. All I'm going to do is take this to the big square trimming block, piece of granite, and uh, lay sandpaper down on top of the granite, and then hand polish this, for lack of better words, perfectly square. Uh, I'll be back. Okay, uh, Afzilla, perfectly flat on both sides. Sorry, perfectly flat on both sides. I've trimmed it down because wood's expensive, especially exotic woods. Perfectly flat, perfectly flat. It's going to sit like this. And I know this looks like a mess right now, but uh, I promise it'll turn. Alright, here's a block of wood I've put together. All it is is coca bowl in the center and olive wood on the left and right. Here's the block all glued together. And I'm going to stick it like this. That's going to be more than long enough for the bottom barrel. The upper barrel I actually plan to uh, do some engraving on, so I'm going to use one solo piece of wood, maybe cap it top and bottom, right or below. I haven't figured it out yet. Okay, I've squared the block up the best I could eyeball style. So, coca bola on the bottom, center stripe. Olive wood left and right of coca bola. Half zilla in the center, right up here above my left hand thumb. Yes, my thumb's been smashed. Uh, blue dyed box elder and brown dyed box elder. That's kind of what it looks like. Now, my goal is to, when I drill the hole, leave enough room up here in the blue uh, that my brass tube's very relatively close. So when I use the uh, little adapter there to square the end for before I stick it on the lathe, I have a blue end to it, and it comes out square. But the hardest part I'm going to have is following this triangle straight down the piece of wood along with this vertical piece. I put the brown on this side trying to cheat it 
so you wouldn't be able to see any of my flaws if I couldn't line it up perfectly straight, if my eye wouldn't catch it. Uh, if I was to put it right here and try to line that up, um, your eye might catch the fact that it's not perfectly center, so I turned it to the side. I really don't know what I'm doing, I'm just trying. Uh, once again, please help by all means, criticisms, critiques, tips, I'll take them. Alright, I don't know how well this is going to work before I drill it, but what I've done is uh, I've miked the end of this and halved it, put having marks up. Oh, I'm not even in my own screen. I've mic'd this and put having marks basically at the end. So that's dead center. And then I drew a line from the tip to the end. I did it on both sides. And then I bisected the coca bola. So I'm hoping I can put this in the vise. Keep that stripe perfectly vertical. And put the bit right there. And it should take care of it. I don't have high hopes. This stuff's hard. You got advice? Holler. Alright, what you're looking at is a drill press, normal drill press. Um, Vice Harbor Freight Special. It's got a little turny handle down uh, here. Moves it in and out. Turn handle over here. Left and right. This is a vice designed specifically for pens. Um, from PSI, uh, if you know what I'm talking about, sorry about boring you, but here is what I need people's help with. This is the hardest part I have of making these things. So I've turned the light on, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. There's that block of wood. And I do nothing but try to eyeball it completely vertical. Um, now when I make this block of wood, I have an issue with making it perfectly square because I'm laminating different pieces together and I'm sanding them and my human hand, obviously anybody's human hand, is it's a little bit rough. Uh, some guys have talked about you know setting it up on a fence on a table saw but a lot of these exotic woods don't come big enough or I don't purchase them big enough to uh, shave that kind of material off to make them perfectly square. Um, what I have left when I'm done gluing all these together and trying to sand it square or taking it to a bandsaw and then sanding it square. Um, there's barely enough material to make the pen out of by the time I'm done. Uh, therefore, uh, those of you guys who are familiar with this vise right here, I don't turn it at a 45 and stick it in the keyhole slots because I don't have it perfectly square. It's going to cock off to the side, so I do my best to eyeball it. I try to walk away from it and eyeball it. And Blah, blah, blah. But you saw my hash marks. Uh, the Brad point here is dead, uh, dead center of the mark in the Coca Bola. What I do as a technique is I actually turn it on because the Brad point is not square. So I turn the drill press on and I eyeball it just to make sure it is still square. I double check and make sure I got enough uh, work piece left to actually make the pen out of it, uh, ensuring that the bushing leaves me enough wood to make a round circle. So. Um, usually I don't show work, but I'm going to show it this time. What I'm doing right now is looking 90 degrees to the left of it and right of it to make sure it's lined up. I try to back up, look at it from different angles, and uh, make sure it's perfectly square. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with drilling a hole. Uh, drilling a hole, everybody has done it later. All right, I changed my mind. I am going to bore you with uh, drilling a hole. One of the things people or I had learned from a metal machinist uh, that I wish I would have learned years and years and years ago is um, there are speeds and feeds to woods and drill bits. And the best way I think I can explain it to you is um, just say you're dealing with purple heart, like uh, drilling concrete. The outside radius of this drill bit right here, the bigger the drill bit, based on RPMs, the faster that outer edge of that circle is going to turn. And it, there comes a point at which the blade on the end of this doesn't have a chance to grab enough wood and rip it out, therefore generating just a bunch of friction. And when you generate a bunch of friction, you generate heat. Because this is the actual edge, you're talking a millionth of an inch there to keep it sharp. Uh, it's going to superheat, you're going to temper it, and it's going to instantaneously become dull. Um, I've already ruined this drill bit. It's self-evident. You can see it in the color. 
I didn't know this at the time. I, I'm, I was just thinking my drill bits suck, they're cheap, and I'm paying a lot of money and it's going to waste. In reality, I was the moron. Uh, it's all about feeds and speeds. So I've got this thing turned down to, uh, right now it's at 1100 RPMs. That's a 10.5 millimeter drill bit. Kind of slow for drilling wood, but um, I probably should slow it down even more to be honest with you. I use air uh, to take the chips out and I back the drill bit out, letting it uh, dissipate some of the heat, trying to save the bit there. As you all know, they're kind of pricey. So here we go. And because it is dull, um, I actually have to apply a little bit of force, which obviously generates a little more heat. So, the Coca Bola and um, olive wood are soft. They're really easy to go through. When I hit that box elder, which is stabilized, it's hard as a rock. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with the rest. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with feeds and speeds, uh, it's all over the internet. I'm utterly surprised I didn't discover it before. It'll save you drill bits. I'll be back. Okie doke. Uh, here's the piece of wood. Here's the hole. It appears to be good. It does appear to be following the uh, coca bola stripe was what the main thing I was after. It uh, did come out offset, but it appears to be lined up quite nicely. Let's see if I can't get this in here with the uh, tip of this triangle. I'm hoping you never really know what you're going to get until you turn it down. At least I'm not good enough to know. Um, what I'm looking for on these bushings is to ensure I have enough material and it looks like I do. Um, if you've never made a pen before uh, these are the bushings that go in here uh, you glue a brass tube in here and these sit inside the brass tube and it tells you the outside diameter of which to knock it down to on a lathe. I know I'm preaching to the choir anybody who's probably looking at this has made these before but yeah I got material and uh, it definitely appears to line up to the triangle and I'm really hoping it follows the stripe. I have a hairline fracture between the woods uh, it's right there so I'm gonna clamp, I'm gonna throw some uh, CA in there, some super thin and clamp it down and hope to God it holds together on the uh, lathe. Um, yeah, later. All right, I need to uh, show slash explain a few things. One, uh, this is going to be the upper portion. Come on, camera. There we go. This is going to be the upper portion of the pen, the cap, however you want to look at it. It's the bigger piece. I'm actually going to engrave something using a laser right here. So this piece of wood, we don't know what it is. A buddy of mine found it. Uh, he's kind of a wood guru. Found it in the woods after a forest fire. Uh, took his knife, opened it up, looked real pretty, so he mailed it to me. Uh, really brittle, full of cracks. I'm trying to hold it together with super glue. We'll see what happens. You can see this hairline crack. Um, for those who've turned a lot, you know exactly what I mean. It's going to take a lot of slow patience and glue and chisel away and more glue. So, anyway, a uh, piece of wood out of the backwoods forest fire. And this up here is Apzilla. What I'm going to do, upper barrel, this is a brass tube I was talking about, is I'm going to place it, come on camera, focus, there we go. Uh, I'm going to take and try to keep it close to the end of Apzilla, so I'm going to chop this off right here and add another piece of wood to the end to give you a rough idea of what I'm doing. Bye.
All right, I'm back. Remember, upper, I'm going to put an engraving right here. So, piece of wood from backyard, uh, Afsilla, and Coca Bola. I'm not wondering if this is in Burmese rosewood, but uh, either way, I don't have to worry about vertical lines, 90 degree angles, or anything. It's kind of a way I cheat. Doesn't look as good. Hold on one sec. The key th you have to have is leave yourself a little bit of wiggle room. So, I left myself very little. So when I go to drill this thing out, I've got to be very, very careful not to, not to do a blowout at the bottom there. Anyway, you get the general idea. And this is probably never going to work. Uh, we'll see. Later. All right, so I've had a complete and epic failure, and I'll share my failures with you. It came to bonded. So the only way to true this hole is to put the brass tube in there and glue them both at the same time. Seeing how uh, CA is not quite doing the job, of which I'm being lazy because I don't want to sit there and keep mixing five-minute epoxy. Um, I'm going to five-minute epoxy the tube in and hope it holds on the lathe. Wish me luck. Okie doke, uh, here's one piece, I've uh, used a little tool to flatten off the ends, for those of you who don't know what it is, I've, forgive me, but I've forgotten the name, but basically it connects to your drill or drill press, and it's got a uh, cutter on the end, and you put sleeves over the, the rod coming out from the center of the cutter, and it helps keep it 90 degrees to it, basically you just stick it in. And it uh, barrel, that's what it is, barrel trims the end. That's one. Here's the other. All barrel trimmed down. And hopefully they're going to hold together on the lathe. This is only the second laminate style pen I've ever made. So, uh, wish me luck. I'm not going to show the lathe due to the fact um, everybody knows what that looks like. Alright, uh, got it turned down round. Trying to get my camera to focus. Sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna try this for a second. Anyway, uh, this is what it looks like. Yeah, this ain't working. I'm gonna pull this off. Camera, referring to the camera, I'll try to hold it by my hand. Nothing worse than a shaky camera though, if you've been a fan of YouTube for any amount of time. Wide. All right, that should give you a rough idea of what it looks like. It's just roughed in right now. It's going to completely change color um, when I CA finish this thing. Uh, old piece of wood is a crack. I can uh, consider it, it adds a uh, character to it. This is the piece that was out of a buddy of mine's backyard. Once again, these are the bushings that tell me how far to take it down. This one's actually tapered further down. Uh, I re if I recall correctly, these two are the same size. And I never chisel this down on the lathe um, all the way. What I end up doing is uh, one of the techniques I've discovered. Let me put this back in here real quick. Is uh, I use a uh, auto body sander. Found it a long, long time ago. I don't remember. It might have been my old roommates from many years ago, but I've held on to it. I bought new its adhesive backing. And basically, it provides me a perfect, when I rest it on the side of the lathe, a perfect straight edge. Now, this one is tapered, so I have to apply a little bit of right hand pressure to it. This one's perfectly level, so I hold it here, and that's how I get my pens perfectly level. Make no mistake, this process is far longer than this video. All right, uh, for those who've turned these things before, um, and those who really haven't are going to, one of the techniques I've learned, this is uh, sandpaper. It's 400 grit. Uh, I buy it in sheets because it's cheaper, and I also kind of buy it in bulk. I buy it online. 
Um, one of the things I've discovered is uh, heat destroys sandpaper really fast. Yes, you old timers probably knew that 30 years ago, but um, what I've learned also that destroys sandpaper that some people might not know is buildup. And what I mean by buildup is I'll turn this on, I'm gonna hit it with a piece of sandpaper. Now it's got a bunch of sawdust on it, and it's really not sanding because all the pores in the saw, uh, sandpaper are blocked off. So what I've learned to do is just take my air chuck from my air compressor and hold it here. If you get the sandpaper hot, it's not gonna work out very well for you and it's gonna break the sandpaper down. So it also helps keep the sawdust out of the pores of the wood. Pores of the wood are what make these things absolutely beautiful. So uh, take that for what it's worth. It's just, this is one of the portions that's gonna take me a good hour. All right, uh, I'm gonna do a little zoom in here. I have um, started out with eight or 60, which was the auto body Bondo remover flatbed tool thingy. I'll try to stick it down here. It's about a foot and a couple inches long, or just a foot long, I'm not real sure, never measured it. And I've gone to 120, two, or yeah, 120, 220. I'm up to 400. There's a couple of points I wanna bring up. One, because these are all different woods, they sand at different rates. So if this wood out here, the olive wood's soft, and this coca bowl is hard as a rock, you can potentially end up with a, a little bit of a raised portion. That's another reason why I use that big wooden flat 80 grit thing to shave it all down perfectly even. Now, some of the stuff that's actually intricate that you really need to pay attention to are the ends where they meet. You need to be the outside diameter of this bushing. This wood has to come to here, and this wood has to come to here. What you will discover based on grains and stuff, I don't know if you can see it in here, but um, it's harder and it's softer. So it sands at different rates. Um, every wood's different, every grain's different, every wood's hard in certain spots and softer in others. You really, I mean, if you're trying to be a perfectionist or you're OCD like me, that's kind of what happens. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little trick that I use. It absolutely destroys sandpaper though, but uh, it makes the finish absolutely beautiful. Now, I do try to take this down just a hair below the bushings, and the reason why is the CA finish gets built up. I'm trying to be perfect when I put the pen together. So I'm gonna turn this thing on, I'm gonna grab this thing by the end, and what you're gonna see is this sandpaper stretch and wrinkle out on the edge. It's because of the heat that I was talking about earlier. So I take this thing and I roll it just like this and I wiggle it. What I'm feeling for is to catch the metal. So the end of the sandpaper is actually catching the metal. And I can feel it right now. So I'm gonna move off to this one. Remember, don't hold your sandpaper in one spot. Keep moving it. As it gets loaded, the only thing you're gonna do is build heat. If you've ever been to Sears school, you know what I'm talking about when you're wiggling sticks together, the little sawdust stuff that comes together and helps you build the fire. Anyway, I'm gonna blow this off real quick, get rid of the loading, help save the sandpaper. But doing this process, let me show you, ruins the sandpaper. I will not use this piece in the center of the wood anymore like this because I don't want these burrs sticking up in there and creating a flaw. Um, my goal is to get this glass smooth before I put the first coat on it and all the dust out of the pores of the wood before I put the first coat of CA on it. Um, one of the other things, this crack right here, I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do with it. And uh, there's another one. It actually should turn out really beautiful, but uh, time will tell. I could be chasing my tail. All right, I have taken it down to a thousand grit, so. These cameras of mine do not want to focus. If you can see these pores in here, that is one of the sole reasons I use the wood and why I blow it out with an air chuck from my air compressor is because I want those pores to be there. I don't want them filled in. I think they're pretty. Some people may beg to differ, but you remember what it looked like before. Um, for the most part, I kind of scored fairly straight, if you recall. I got lucky, and that point here is in the middle. 
Now I'm going to come over here. And yeah, you see the hairline fractures, but uh, I'm going to show you how I'm going to fix those. And I'm going to leave them because I think they add, I don't know, I think they look cool. I do this for me, not necessarily everybody else. Uh, it's a stress reliever, so. Anyway, um, if you're thinking about doing this, this takes a long time. All right, a couple of things I can't reiterate enough. I'm going to fix this crack and this crack. The key to success to leave wood all pretty and shimmering is get all the sawdust out of it. And um, another, I don't know, I'm not sold on sanding sealer. I'm not sure I truly understand it though, because I'm still a novice. Now, for those of you who build these things and have been doing this for years, these bushings, obviously I have my mandrel loose. So you see me sliding the gap? Putting a gap in between all of these is about the only way I've ever found not to adhere my woodwork to the bushing and hope when I go to pull it apart, it doesn't take the wood with it. Um, so if you guys got uh, tricks of the trade out there, holler at me, let me know, I'd, I'd gladly take them. But for now, all I do is back the bushings off just a hair. Uh, CA super glue, typical stuff from PSI, I'm probably paying way too much. And corner of a shop towel, I do use a X-Acto knife or a razor blade and I cut these out trying to keep the uh, paper filament from getting into the super glue. So right now I'm not gonna coat this thing, but what I am gonna do is fill the cracks. I am not going to add uh, an accelerator to it because accelerators typically, when the super glue gets thick, will instantly boil it and turn it white. Um, I want a smooth, clean finish to where the user can actually look inside the crack and it just looks like glass inside the crack. So anyway, um, I'm going to start with a small one first. Some woods, mind you, and I warn people on this one, some woods have a, um, an oil or an acid in them or something that actually accelerates super glue on their own. I, I've yet to really figure out which woods do what, but uh, I have had woods that super accelerate super glue. So anyway, here we go. And this is a, uh, a timed event, obviously. That one's getting filled in. Now I'm wiping it off, and the reason why I'm wiping it off is because I don't want uh, an abnormal lump on there when I go to sand it again, because I've got it perfectly round, and I don't want it not perfectly round, for lack of better words. Basically, I'm just letting that fill in. I'm going to give it a wipe. One of the other things I've learned with super glue is um, don't keep messing with it. Leave it alone, uh, or it's going to ruin your day. Anyway, that one's getting filled in quite nicely. It's going to take me a while to, believe it or not, the pores are going to need coats. I'm going to coat this up uh, with a couple of layers of super glue. And um, as long as it's relatively smooth, because sometimes super glue gets rough and bubbles based on wood oils and acids, uh, I'm going to take this upper barrel and this camera, and I'll take you over and show you CAD and Rhino and Corel Draw and laser cut, followed by the laser doing its thing in the wood. All right, bye. Okay, what I'm going to do is here's the upper portion of the pen, the cap, uh, commonly referred to as the upper barrel. Uh, it's been coated once, sanded back down with uh, CA. I've worked on actually a few times filling in this uh, crack here. It's getting smooth, we're getting there. But anyway, here's the bushings. They go in the end like this, brass tube, like Yogi. So on here, what I'm going to show you is a uh, I have a fourth axis. I basically disconnect the uh, X axis on the laser and I connect the rotary attachment on the X axis. I guess it's only three if you want to think of it that way. And I'm going to put this on here. And one of the issues I have doing this, putting this piece down here on, on the mandrel, this end slides over, holds it still, this spins, is I've got to tell the X axis the outside diameter of this piece. 
So when it goes to draw, I'm going to put an aircraft on here, specifically an Apache, and I'm going to etch an Apache across here. Then I'm going to backfill it and probably inlay it with, um, I don't know, aluminum, brass, or copper. I really haven't decided yet. I'll show you that process. But I've got to tell it as it rotates how big it is so that it is proportional across the upper barrel. Um, obviously, if this was bigger and this thing turned a quarter of a turn, you'd actually cover like two inches. If it's smaller, uh, let's call this a quarter of an inch around, and it turned a quarter of a turn, you'd only move, you know, one thirty-second of an inch. So uh, it's going to take a little bit of programming, and I'll show you how I do it. All right, I need to know the diameter of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mic this end out, and it comes out to, we'll call it 16.4. I'll do it again. 16.37, 16.42. Now remember, this end's smaller. 14.5, do it again, 14.5. I'm doing it in millimeters, by the way, because I couldn't afford a real laser. Or for lack of better words, a high-end American-made one. Uh, so mine's made in China, so everything runs on metric, and there's no way to convert it yet, so I measure in metric. 16.4, uh, or 16.4. 14.5, 16.4, I always measure like four times, so forgive me, 16.4, 14.5. So now, as you can see, I got the calculator open down there in the corner. I'm going to take 16.4 plus... Fourteen point five, fourteen point five, and then I'm going to divide that in half because I'm going to put this object right in the middle. The taper of this barrel, top to bottom, is very minuscule. So divided by two equals fifteen point four five. Fifteen point four five. And uh, I'm going to take for granted you all are familiar with circle math. So, let's see here. 15.45 uh, times 3.14159 equals 48.537. I'm going to write this down, so bear with me. Barrel. 48537565. Now, on my rotary axis, I have uh, the brass gears at the end. I have a, a, a stepper in there, or a steps uh, gear assembly. Blah, I can't talk. Basically, it's a two to one gear reduction, so I have to divide that by two. All right, 24, 26878275. Divided by two, which is I'm writing all this down: two, four, two, six, eight, seven, two, four point two six eight seven eight two seven five eight two seven five eight two seven five. So two six eight seven eight two. Seven, five. All right. With those numbers, uh, I'm going to put them in here, and I apologize, it's actually the y-axis I disconnected, and I'm going to put them into the pulse unit calculation here. So 24.268878275. And I'm going to click OK, and now it tells the machine pulse unit measurement on uh, descend. My uh, it's a DC servo motor step 1.8 degrees. Uh, I have it set at 3200, so uh, I'm guessing it takes 32 pulses to move at 1.8 degrees. Is what the math is doing right here. I'm going to hit pause for a minute because I always want to double check my math and make sure I didn't do a keystroke entry wrong. Because if I did, it's the end of my work piece, and I've learned that the hard way. So. Uh, I'll be back with you in a minute.
All right, I'm back with you. Uh, math worked out, so I put that into the Y-axis options. I'm going to put this Apache on there. One of the key things that I've screwed up a couple of times, and I hope I never make this mistake again, is I've got to remember how this is laid out in reference to how it's actually going to cut on the machine. A lot of machines don't necessarily, if you use Rhino, uh, AutoCAD, all that good stuff, um, what you see on the screen it might contribute to something completely oriented different on your machine. So I know for a fact this is going to work right. This blue dot right here is my laser or, uh, origination point. It's actually dead center of all of this. So I'm going to double check and make sure that's right. So I go up here to laser, set laser origin, and I change it to top center and then move it to center and click OK. It is center. I have it clicked over here on the right hand side to immediate which means it's going to start in here in the very center. Uh, I'm cutting at uh, a speed of 10 millimeters a second at a 10% power. I'm running 60, I think 60 watts. All right, here in a second, I'll show you how I align the machine to start the engraving. All right, I want the image in the center piece. Top and bottom pieces aren't exactly the same width, so I've mic'd out, if you can see this, I'm going to back the, there we go, it's a little bit better. Um, I've mic'd out between the barrels, it's roughly, um, it's 29.5. So 29.5 divided by 2 is 14.75 millimeters. So right now I'm going to... 1475 anyway you get the general idea um, I'm gonna lock it in place and I'll show you what I'm doing next okay we're back inside the laser and um, this is nothing more than a piece of plexiglass that is pretty accurate and what it is is um, this lens right here needs to be focused to the workpiece so because the Y motor is not attached, I can just move it on over. And what I'm going to do is on the Z axis up and down, is I'm going to make sure it's at the correct focus height. So I'm going to move this a little bit closer. And what I'm trying to do is get this ear horn to be flush with the top of this thing. And it obviously needs to come down a little bit. So you're going to hear some beeps while I cycle through this thing. needs to come a little bit closer All right, that is close. So I'm gonna move the, it's got a red dot on it. I'm gonna move the red dot over the object. I'm standing perpendicular to the workpiece, so it's going away from me right now, and I'm eyeballing to make sure it's dead in the center. And it's dead center of the top of the workpiece. Now, if you recall, I've got this loose right now. There's a crack right there. And there's a crack right there. I like the looks of the cracks. So I'm going to leave them alone. So I'm going to rotate this right here and I'm going to lock it in place. Alright, it's locked in place. Now I need to center it x-axis or left and right as you're looking at it. And the best I, way I've found to come up to do this is actually stick the micrometer in here and remember I did the math I divided the micrometer in half so the width and the math or the micrometer is actually uh, half of the length of the piece I want to engrave on so I'm going to take this dot and I'm going to move it right over wow that's pretty good usually I don't get that lucky that fast all right, so it's perfectly centered. 
I'm going to double check my work here. I am centered that way. I am centered left and right. So I'm going to close the lid and make sure you got a good view. I'm going to turn this off for a sec so I can set this up, not waste your time. All right, I'm back with you. I'm trying to get it to focus, sorry. It's probably about as good as I'm gonna get it. Now, I had to reprogram this laser to tell it the machine options, and then I loaded the file. So, it's gonna get a little noisier. I'm turning on the water chiller, uh, which cools down the CO2 laser. I'm gonna give it a second. And then I gotta turn on an exhaust fan motor. So it's coming on. Uh, hope you can still hear this, but I'm going to let you watch the show. One of the first things I'm going to do, though, is have it run through a mode called test to make sure everything's working correctly. You're going to see it move around, but it's not going to etch anything. All right, I got a soft stop issue. Uh, I'll figure it out here and get back with you. Okay, I'm back. Uh, hope you're gonna be able to see this, but uh, the soft stop issue is one of the reasons why I run the test. Um, the system is semi-smart on this Chinese laser, not 100% idiot proof, but uh, it, it lets me know when there's a conflict, be it software or hard stop. In other words, it thinks it's all the way left, all the way right, X, Y, Z, that sort of axis thing. What it was is I did not rotate the rotary axis far enough, so it actually thought in its head the, that it was up against the back mechanical stops. So I'm going to run the test real quick, and you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm actually going to run it quite a few times, making sure that my engraving's not going to roll into one of those cracks. And it is. So what I'm going to do is rotate the workpiece. And I'm going to try it there. All right, that's about as close as I can get it between the cracks. Uh, you're gonna hear me turn the exhaust fan on and then you're gonna see it cut away. It's gonna be pretty short-lived, but enjoy. Looks like we're done. I'm going to let the fan run for a second. Uh, the wood looked like it touched off a few times, which is never a good sign. Fixing to see how well this actually worked. Hopefully it's okay. I have my doubts though.
Well, I'm going to have to get that out of the bottom of the damn machine. Shim fell down. Alright, I'm going to pick the camera up with a better background. Widen out the lens. Alright, I missed all the cracks, which is a very good thing. I got clean marks. Looking good. Alright, if you see... Let me try to... Come on, camera. Alright, there we go. Good clean marks. I'm looking for the brass tube in the background. I'm barely seeing it, which is not a good sign because I need room to put that dust in there. Anyway, the halo effect you see around the image is the off-gassing from the portions that are burnt out. I'm going to show you a real neat trick I discovered by accident on how to fix that before you add glue because you don't want to leave that off-gassing on the wood. I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. Here's the workpiece. And this is actually how I clean out the soot and get rid of that uh, off-gassing. And basically it's kind of sticky. All it is is uh, resin. Um, wood sap and whatever. It's just sticky. It's, you don't want it on there. Um, this is like a dollar. Put whatever you want spray bottle in it. And I put 98 cents worth of isopropyl alcohol. And I just go to town with the alcohol. And I gently spray these out. Some of these little cuts and circles are super fine. Remember, if it made a circle around it, it uh, the only thing holding that circle in place is the glue that attaches it to the brass piece that's right here. So you don't want to squirt too awful hard, but I soak it pretty good, and literally all the off-gassing goes away off the piece of wood. Don't do this if you don't super glue your piece first. Um, it's another reason why I super glue my piece first, or CA finish it, give it a couple of coats before I take it to the laser machine so I don't damage the wood. But uh, this technique seems to work really, really well. It cleans out the little pieces and parts in it. Anyway, uh, looking pretty clean. All I'm going to do is take my air chuck and blow it dry in the next stop lathe. Okay, doke, we're back on the lathe, and here's what it looks like. Now there's a couple of things I want to point out. Let me get a pencil. I'm just using a pencil to point stuff out, but... Um, Afzilla, see all these open pores? That dust will go in the pores and ruin your project. Another reason why you add a CA finish to it before you add the, the dust. Um, one of the things I missed is there's a pore right here that I didn't get all the way filled in. So I'm going to try to mask this with just plain old tape, basically, and uh, keep that dust out of there. Um, I've learned all these little idiosyncrasies the hard way, which basically trashes a project. I made it this far, several hours into it, and um, yeah, I don't want it to get messed up. So I'm going to pause it for a minute. Uh, if you see the shiny stuff in there, that's actually the brass tube behind it. These are supposed to be rocket pods, or I'm sorry, missile racks. It's supposed to be four little missiles right there. Uh, what you'll discover if you do use a laser is every wood burns differently at different rates, and based on the grain pattern and knots and sap content, it can burn bigger, it can burn smaller. Uh, it's absolutely uncontrollable for me. I have yet to figure out a way, so if... Um, Somebody's figured it out before me, by all means leave a comment, let me know, but uh, I'm going to mat tape this up and then I'll be back. Alright, we're back. It's all taped up and uh, I've gone over every pore I can find. I actually did a really bad job of uh, sealing this up with CA before I took it to the laser. And uh, yeah, so wish me luck. This tape is going to be a nightmare after uh, I get some glue in there. It's going to take me a long time to get this backed around. And, uh, well, you know the deal. Anyway, I want to turn you on to a couple of products. I'm going to turn around here and face up. 
That right there is actually a chemical air dryer. I use it on the laser so I don't get any impurities. But what I'm looking for, there it is. All right, everybody sees all these little box things. Those are an assortment. Uh, each one of those little containers, 89 cents container store, I have filled with a different powder. And I'll show you what I mean here in a second. I'm going to face to a non-contrasting ground here. There we go. All right. This is aluminum powder. And it is exquisitely fine. It's like dust. And it comes out almost looking like chrome if you enter this stuff right in the voids. Um, it's as fine as ash. Works great. So I got aluminum powder. Here's copper. Comes out the same color. Now remember, a lot of times too with some of these products, when you add glue, sometimes they can change color. And one of the things I've discovered that actually turns out really nice, if I want black, I've taken brown box elder, dyed box elder, and used 600 grit sandpaper and a high powered sander, and I sanded a basically a pop full. Stuck some to the top, ignore this little strip, it's a piece of glued something. But that's the color it's going to come out, black, almost solid black. It's a fine powder, works great for inlays, it works great for dark woods to fill the voids. Um, ran into it by accident, and then after reading the internet, come to find out I'm uh, way behind the power curve. I'm going to show you a couple other items real quick. Um, brass, really cool, come on focus. It's powdery. Uh, match light is a stone. It's green, works great. This is lapis, you see in that bag. Uh, yeah, the blue stone the Egyptians got from Southeast Asia, that lapis. It works great, but I've yet to ever find it in powdered form. A lot of the crushed stones, a lot of them say they're in powdered form, but they're not small enough to get into um, the cuts in the wood made by the laser. So what I'm trying to show you, this is crushed pink coral. $10 for this little bag. I think I paid $20 for that bag of lapis. And if you can see it, it's about your average beach sand size. It is not going to fit into my Apache engraving on that piece of wood. I, I made the mistake, I destroyed a, a work piece one time thinking I could shove it in there. And like a moron, it didn't work. So powder, powder, powder. It has to be super fine if you're going to actually do this kind of um, laser engraving and backfilling. Uh, last but not least, if it's stone, let me move you back up here. It's not going to be fine enough to fit inside that. Let me try to get this to focus a little bit better. Focus. There we go. Uh, I will show you the width. I'll give you an idea of the width. Bear with me one second. This is five millimeter lead. I'll try to hold it off. It is wider than the engraving marks to give you an idea of how small it is. A grain of sand is about the diameter of lead, if not bigger. At least a lot of it is. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to do this in black. It's not going to be that fancy. I was planning on using a, um, a metal just to show you guys, but the general principle remains the same. Uh, aluminum turns out kind of chrome looking, a little bit duller in chrome. Brass turns out a um, just like super shiny brass, like a brass doorknob. Uh, Matchlight, the green stuff, uh, real pretty green. It's right in the middle of the hue, basically. It's not dark, it's not bright. Lapis, although blue, let me pull it back out for you real quick, if you guys choose to use lapis. Uh, my camera is picking up the correct color in its crushed form. Lapis, when mixed with glue, gets dark. Uh, a real dark, pretty blue. A little bit darker than this. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. I love using it, uh, but it's not going to work on this project. I'll be back with you in a minute while I get set up to fill this thing in. Okay, I'm back. Uh, using brown box elder. 
some 600 grit sandpaper, made a pile of it and threw it in this little container. That's the color it's going to come out when added with super glue. It's not the same color if you take notice. I've laid a piece of um, magazine paper down here. It's the shiny laminate magazine paper and kind of why I've done it is because I can take whatever spills off and put it right back into the container. So isopropyl alcohol, good CA finish will help you out. Tape up any wood imperfections that you have in the grain. So I'm just going to take this powder and I'm going to pour it on here and lightly rub. Remember, if I put a lot of pressure, I can knock out one of those center pieces because they're only held on by a little tiny piece to the brass tube. There's no more lateral support. And I literally just sit here and rub and rub and rub some more and rub some even more. And rub and kind of tap. And I want this stuff buried in these little crevasses, all these little etching marks. Another reason why I use isopropyl alcohol is the charred remains or the edges of the engraved area or cut area if you're a machinist or laser guy. Um, it's got charred, basically charcoal on it, burnt wood, and that helps wash it out so you don't end up with it exchanging basically burnt wood into the sawdust affecting your color range if you're using a lighter colored wood. I've got everything from pine to um, if it turns out pretty with super glue, I sand a bunch off and stick it in a box and save it. Put a little dab of it on the top of the box so I know what color it actually turns out in super glue format. I'm not rubbing very hard. Uh, also to make sure I don't create a divot inside of one of the engraved areas. Once again, if you're a laser guy, one of the cut areas. I'd explain that portion, but it's unless you own a laser, it's pointless. Anyway, uh, I've knocked off a majority of the dust. So I will be back with, uh, since I put some gloves on and find some super thin, I'll be back in a minute. Alrighty, here we go. Normally I don't use crazy glue. Uh, I just I reached over and grabbed a bottle of my super thin that I bought from PSI and I think they stuck the wrong label on it. Um, boy, this ain't looking too thin. All right, that'll work. What you want to do is coat the snot out of it. You don't want to put so much on there that it actually washes out the, um, the engraved areas, basically. You don't want to have it rolling off of this thing and washing out the good stuff. Boy, I think I might be in trouble here. Keep putting it on there. If you see it get dark like it's absorbed all of it, I just keep putting some more. Alright, looks fairly absorbed. Go away, bubbles. Alright, that's all in there. Here comes a run against the clock without wiping any of this clean. Putting this under here. I'm hoping I can get this tape off before it sets. If you can get the tape off, boy, it helps a lot. Um, leaving this on here is utterly miserable. Be very, very careful though not to knock out any of the engraved areas. And obviously I'm up against the clock to do this, so I'm kind of hurrying.
All right, I scored. This doesn't always work, but um, I know it looks terrible right now. I'm going to add one more drop. Uh, but I promise it will look great. Now, if you're using metals, uh, it can create all sorts of different metal flakes in the pores. I've already talked about that. This isn't that big of a deal because I chose black. But um, no, <laughs> no, 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 accelerant. If you use accelerant, it's going to boil and it's going to haze or turn milky white and absolutely ruin your workpiece. So from here, um, I let her sit and I let her sit as vertical as I can. I'll be back in an hour or two. All right, uh, I discovered something when working with the upper barrel. This is obviously the lower. Uh, I generated myself an epic failure uh, to the point where this thing's probably trashed. And what it is, I'm gonna tighten this up a little bit. I want you to watch real close right here. It's nice and flush. Watch this. Now there's a gap. I don't know if you can really break it out on the camera. I'm gonna try to zoom in a little bit for you. See if I can't get it to focus. Not quite. Maybe back out just a hair. Uh, still trying to get it to focus. Almost. Come on, camera. There we go. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Right now it's not flush, not flush, not flush, and perfectly flush right there. I'm looking at the top. Right here across the top. Watch that gap generate between the bushing and the wood. That's going to generate a noticeable gap between the metal parts. Um, here's where I messed up, and don't you guys duplicate it. Is a long time ago I realized the super glue remover or debonding material smelled a lot like nail polish remover. So I ran down and bought some nail polish remover. And when I'm done with these bushings, because I have a bunch of glue on them and stuff, I just drop them in the nail polish remover, come back out with a little magnetic pickup, pull them out of the bottle and wipe them off, and the glue comes right off. Well, like a retard, uh, when I was building this, I'd switch kits. And I had another set of bushings inside here, and I pulled out the wrong bushings and tried to make the kit off of it. And what had happened was, is the inside diameter of this bushing that goes into the brass pipe in here, was smaller and when I cinched it down it cocked it off to the side and I obviously took a chisel and made it round while it was cocked off to the side now I'm missing material so I'm gonna go for broke and hopefully try to save this piece and what I'm gonna try to do is build up a layer of CA right over the top of this bushing and hope I can cut it off and uh, make it smooth because CA will come out so clear it'll still look like wood and you won't be able to tell the depth but it'll be smooth once the pen is actually pressed together. Moving over to this thing here and there's the apache. The missiles right here didn't turn out too well obviously. Let me see if I can't change a little light. But um, the wood kinda just kept burning. I couldn't stop it. Those didn't turn out too bad. I'm going to rearrange the camera here and see if I can't get a better shot. It's about as close as I can get, but it looks like garbage right now because I've thrown a couple coats of super glue on it, 600 grit sandpaper, more super glue. But when I'm done, it will, uh, it will be beautiful. Hopefully I'll be able to save that lower barrel. Wish me luck. Okay, uh, there's several coats, I know it looks dull, but there are several coats of uh, CA on here. And one of the things I've learned uh, the hard way many times, to include the very last project I did, is you have to get rid of the bushings were sitting on either end, you have to get rid of the CA that just might stick off uh, less than a thousandth of an inch, because if you don't sand it down, what's going to happen when you press the components in, so it's going to press on that outer layer of the CA and it's going to crack it all the way back. I've had a crack as far as a quarter inch on the back. So what I do is I take a piece of 400 grit sandpaper and at a 45 degree angle I drag this across and I twist it. And I'm sanding this literally, I'm almost literally taking it right back down to the wood right here on the corner. 
When you assemble the pen, though, you're never going to see it. But um, that keeps the CA from sticking back to where the pen components go and you don't smash it. A few times I'll drag it vertically while rotating it across the sandpaper. But the worst thing you can do is leave CA sticking off the end. When you press your pen parts together, it'll crack. All right, the final grit I put on this, I think was six, 700, maybe a thousand. I really don't remember. But um, my goal when I do this, and I add CA to this piece here over and over and over again, and then I sand it and add it more, is the final sanding I do, be it 600 or a thousand. When I turn it, I'm looking to find no shiny spots. Shiny spots represent a dip in the wood, or kind of like a, stick my finger in here, a dip in the wood. <laughs> that um, the sandpaper didn't reach. So if you look right here, there's a shiny spot. And there's another one in the other rocket pod. I don't want to keep building and building. I've tried. I've got this kind of level. We're going to see what it looks like on the pen. I'm probably going to be pissed, but um, I, I learned something with each and every one of these things I do, and I've probably got a few thousand hours doing this. It's retarded. But um, for what it's worth, so I got plastic polish, comes in all sorts of different font, shapes, sizes, uh, one step. I got some other stuff showing up or something. And it's literally, I turn it up and I start polishing away. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the magic and actually how well this actually works. Boy, I do not want to get this on the lens of my camera. The goal is not to generate heat, press hard, at least I found that with mine. Um, I'm actually using, I buy chamois, they're relatively cheap, and uh, this stuff kind of eats through it, which is a good sign, it's polishing, but um, I just take a little square. If I'm doing a couple in a couple days or whatever, I'll just put this little piece of chamois inside a Ziploc bag, try to save a little bit. And this is it, really. It's spinning pretty quick. So, I don't have it turned all the way up. It's about three quarters of the way. I'm not real sure. I got a jet lathe. Mine's a variable speed with a belt change. We'll see what happens. Anyway, just to prove a point so I don't make this video longer than it has to be, I'm gonna turn this down. Going to grab a clean cloth. And I'm going to turn it off. This is just a rough end polish, and you can already see the difference. When I'm done, it'll look like glass. Uh, the next thing you're going to see is a pen press. Alrighty, uh, the pen press. Uh, typical press here, I'll show it to you. Cheap, but it works very well. That is the lower barrel. Let me try to get some light over here. There, it's a little bit. Alright, if you're going to build something like I'm ornate, and you put it, I've learned this hard way, put the center stripe in here, and you want the cap to line up with the center stripe. So I'm going to use the other pen I did that uh, I attempted to line up two center stripes. So when you screw it on, you want the stripes to line up, right? In order to do that, you actually have to take these threaded pieces right here, screw, press this part together, kind of see here's the one piece, here's the upper. You're going to press this into your blank, or my blank for that case. What did I do with my blank? Here it is. So I'd press it in here, and then I'd screw it on without having this pressed into this piece. I'd screw it on to the end of this. And then I'd line up the two stripes in the piece of wood, the upper and the lower. Just to drive the point home again, here's the pen. And you want these stripes to line up. This piece right here with the threads is the same as that piece. So you'd have to put this upper piece together first to 
twist it on there and then see how they don't line up and it's just a matter of threading I can grab the next thread and it'll line up but um, you have to put it on there put it down tight and then align this with the stripe take the cap back off and press it together don't make the same mistake I did by not lining these threads up to their upper component if you're going to put a vertical accent in the bottom and the top. Otherwise, it's just never going to line up. Um, this thing's pretty self-explanatory. It's just a press. So here we go. One of the things I want to do is make sure I got equal pressure. Everything's going in relatively stiffly, which is good. And it's together. Voila. Top and bottom. So with that, I am going to screw the end on. There's the end. This is the upper. Of which, oh my god, I hope I didn't make a mistake. Nope, I sure didn't. Okay. Remember to lay your pieces out right and dry fit them before you press it together. There's the bottom of the pen. Here, I'll just throw the ink in there. Remember to follow the instructions. Improper spring placement can lead to a headache. You'll get it stuck in there. Once these things are together, they do sell uh, disassembly kits. But uh, I've found that they really don't work all that well. All right, this is a bottom end. The kits change over the years too, but bear with me while I assemble this. All right, voila, bottom's done. I'm gonna stick it in a, uh, I love that glimmer. Um, you'll see more of this. Let me finish it up and then I'll stick it in the photo booth for better viewing. I know I'm screwing this up. All right, here's an alignment deal. Here's the pin I just showed you. I am gonna show you, and I have to align this. I've completely forgot about it. So this is just sitting here. This is threaded. I'm gonna stick this on the end. And I want this, when the pen's closed, to line up with the vertical stripe to the uh, Apache. So there's the vertical stripe. There's the Apache. Maybe just a hair over. I think that looks halfway decent. All right, so the Apache, when the cap's on the pen, is going to line straight up to this brown piece. And all I'm going to do is unscrew this and press this together. All right, here's the finished pen. I'll back it out a little bit. A little too shiny, but uh, it's vertically aligned with the Apache. So I'll start at the bottom. I'm going to take the cap off. And what I'm feeling for, if you remember that bushing was too small and I tried to build it up. Um, looking at it naked eye, can't really see it. And it all feels smooth. It meets up with the metal parts is which I was after. Um, all aligned pretty. Here's the apache. All right, you remember me talking about not sanding these things at a 45? If you don't, when you press it together, ta-da, crack. Right there at the end of my thumbnail. Yes, I smashed my thumb. Um, I'm a little OCD. I like things perfect. But I'm also impatient, so I don't do things as much as I should. You can ever so slightly maybe see a little bit of the... Looks like little stripes. It could be a reflection from the light bulbs. I don't know. That drives me nuts. All it took was a couple more swipes on the sandpaper and I'd have a flawless finish. But no. 10, 20 hours worth of doing this stupid pen and I cracked the finish. And I have no idea on how to fix it. Anyway, there it is. 
Uh, for you professionals who have done this a ton of times and are watching this out of curiosity, I will take comments all day long. And right, wrong, or indifferent, people don't like it, tell me what they don't like. I'm rather curious as to what the general population thinks. Here's the cracks that were formerly in the wood that I was talking about that are all filled in. I think they just add character. They kind of look cool. Anyway, let me know what y'all think. Later.